Well, open, if you would, this morning, please, to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3. And we're going to continue in our uh, talk on letters from Paul. Today, here's what we have on tap. Our theology today is thankfulness is a distinguishing mark of the person of faith. Thankfulness is a distinguishing mark of the person of faith. Our application today is thankfulness is born out of a true understanding of God's good grace. And our prayer today is God, give us thankful hearts. If you're wondering how do we talk about this at home with our kids, what's our family focus, super simple, be thankful to God. Be thankful to God. The theology being thankfulness is a distinguishing mark of the person of faith. One of my favorite texts here is uh, Colossians 3. A number of years ago, uh, a buddy of mine and I were talking, and, and we both realized that we needed to maybe work on committing more scripture to memory and, and being diligent to, to know the scripture better. And so I said, well, you, you pick a text for us. And he said, I'm going to pick Colossians 3, 1 through 17. And I said, great. And so we decided to memorize this together. And like uh, a month later, I got with him and I said, all right, I'm working on it. I've got about half of it. I was very slow. And, uh, and I said, how far are you? And he goes, I haven't started yet. And so like two months later, I was like, okay, I've gotten it. How far are you? And he goes, I haven't started yet. And now about eight years later, he still hadn't started. So, uh, but... <laughs> Because of my friend, I, I have really come to love this text, and um, it's, it's one that I, I find very dear. It, it's, we've talked about it a lot. We've touched on it a lot, uh, about setting our mind on the things of Christ, setting our mind where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. But he kind of has this contrasting thing going on in Colossians, and he starts Colossians 3 with put away these things, and then in Colossians 3, if you'll pick up with me in verse 12, here are the things that he is encouraging those followers of Christ to put on. Colossians 3.12 says this, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against the other, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God, and whatever you, <coughs> you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is such a great text, and there's a lot to unpack here. We don't have time to unpack it all, but one of the things that I had done initially when I was looking at this, especially verses 15 through 17, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, and then verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, and then verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And these are all key things that should be taught, that should be talked about, should be uh, discussed. We should talk about what it means in verse 15 to let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. He's just mentioned that if you have a complaint against someone, they should forgive you. You should forgive them. You should be forgiving towards one another. And, and so the peace here is the peace between the brethren. That's an important thing to talk about. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's an important thing to talk about. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's an important thing to talk about. But each of these things, and it took me a while to really appreciate this, each of these things ends with thankfulness. Verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do or were in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Thankfulness. It's mentioned three times here, and, and I think the temptation, at least for me early on when I was looking at this text, was to gloss over it for the, the first half of each of those verses. Let peace rule among you. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Do everything in the name of Jesus Christ. With thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving. There's, an, I, there's a concept here. In fact, Paul will talk about it a lot. We'll look at it here in a minute. But, but there, there, this idea of peace ruling amongst the believers and being thankful, Paul will mention it almost in almost every one of his letters. He starts off his letters uh, addressing the church that he's writing and saying, I am thankful to God for you. And in almost all of them, he closes the letter again expressing thanks for the believer. 
Thanks for his fellow worker in Christ. Thanks for those who put faith in Jesus. And he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, that let there be unity in the church, and be thankful. One of the things that we ought to, as believers, be thankful for is one another. We should be grateful to God for each other. We should delight in God that this, we have this family. Man, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, I think I was well into being an adult and well into being a preacher before I came to the place where I thought of uh, the people that I was doing church with as family. I've always been in church. I've been in church my entire life. I don't ever remember a time not being in church. When we went to a church in Midland until I was about eight or nine years old, I don't remember feeling ever the call to it being family. We showed up. We went week in and week out. Uh, then from there, we moved to another church where I sat under a pastor for two years who would become one of my favorite pastors at 10 years old. Like, I love this guy. Uh, he, I think I told you before, and he was the first pastor that didn't stand behind a pulpit. He was a short little guy, kind of balding, and he would walk all over the stage, and I just thought, I didn't know you could do that. Like, I didn't know you could move, you know? And I just thought, this guy is really cool. At 10 years old, the bar's low, but uh, he... He changed a lot of my views of God, and yet I still didn't think of, man, these people are people that I want to do life with. It wouldn't be until I was an adult that I came to the place where I thought, these are the people that I want to do life with. You being here and being part of the 456 church, we're not asking you uh, to just show up on Sundays. We're asking you to do life with us, to be grateful for us as we are grateful for you, to be able to fellowship with one another and pray for one another and serve one another and walk beside one another and just minister to each other's needs. Like, this is, this is family. To be thankful for one another. I am deeply thankful for the people that God has brought into my life that have pressed me deeper into the heart of God. The next part he says is this in verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I have always been taught I think we talked about it in here. It may have been a Wednesday night study, but I've always been taught, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly was the Bible. Uh, in the New Testament, when they are referring to the written text, they call it the scripture. Here, read it this way and it'll make more sense. Let the message of Christ, let the message of Christ dwell in you richly. This is the message of the gospel. This is that Jesus came and that he died for us, that he was raised from the dead, that he ascended into heaven, that he's coming again one day. Let the message of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. What it has in mind here is let, let the word of Christ, let the message of Christ, let who Jesus is dwell in you so richly that it permeates uh, your speaking to one another, that it permeates our, our singing with one another, and fills our hearts with thankfulness. We're going to come back to this in a minute in our application, but it is a very difficult thing for us. Oftentimes, it is a difficult thing for us to be thankful for what Christ has done and what has promised us in his return. It's just sometimes a little too far out there for us to really think about because we're thinking more about today and this moment and this time rather than who Christ is. But Paul says, man, he goes, think on the message of Christ, think on the word of Christ, teach one another, admonish one another in wisdom, singing psalms and hymns with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And then he says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Giving thanks to God for who Christ is and who Christ is in us. I think of Paul in, in Romans chapter 7 when he's talking about what it looked like to live under the law. He says that, that he's a wretched man and he says, who will rescue me from this body of death? Who will rescue me from, from this sin according to the law, this sin that has lived in me? And then he says this, he gives the answer, he asks the question and then gives the answer and says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God. It would take us uh, more than one sermon uh, to look at all the places that Paul directs thankfulness to God in his letters. It, it would take us, just, just to read the text and for me to explain the context of each one would take us probably two or three sermons. It is something that Paul mentions a lot. In fact, um, one, of my, one of my favorite little side notes, my favorite little text is in Second Thessal sorry, 1 Thessalonians 5. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, I forgot to include this one in my notes, so I'll have to jot it down so I don't forget it in the next one. But 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul says this. 
if I can find it here. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17, and 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in everything, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks, some of your translations will say, in all circumstances, for this is God's will for your life in Christ Jesus. It's difficult, isn't it? Isn't it difficult to be thankful uh, thankful to God in all circumstances. It's kind of like what James says. Now, we're not talking about James right now. We're talking about Paul, but we'll borrow from James. And in James chapter 1, verse 3, he says, Consider it pure joy, my brethren, when you face trials of many kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish this work, making you mature and complete, not lacking anything. Like God is doing his work in us. Paul says in the beginning of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he goes, uh, he goes I, am, I am comforted in my affliction affliction so that I can comfort you. That what God is working in me, God is working in me for your benefit and your blessing and your glory. Or for his glory. Your benefit and your blessing, but for his glory. Look at this over in Ephesians 5. This is from Ephesians 5. Remember, thankfulness is a distinguishing mark of the person of faith. Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 4, says this. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or covetousness, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God. So there's this contrast. Don't, don't let your mouth be filled with these things, but instead let your mouth be filled with thanksgiving. Drop down a few verses into to verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand the will of the Lord. And do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled, be controlled by the Holy Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody to the Lord with all your heart, giving thanks always. I love this. Listen, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Give thanks always and for everything to God. I, I will be honest that thankfulness is probably, uh, not probably, that's being too kind to myself. Thankfulness is something I need to work on. I need, I need to be more deliberately thankful to God. But... It comes out of a heart. Look at this. This is our application today. Thankfulness is born out of a true understanding of God's good grace. Thankfulness comes from a place of knowing who God is, knowing what he's accomplished, knowing what he's done in our lives. Thankfulness is stirred up in us out of who God is and what he's done. Some of us, I think, would have a, a response to a sermon on thankfulness, and we'd say, well, you don't know what my life has been like. You don't know the things that I've suffered. You don't know the loss that I've endured. You don't know the pain. I, I probably don't. I probably don't. But I have come to know who God is and what God has done. And the work that God has done in us and, and, and the salvation by which he has saved us is, is bigger than our suffering. You know how uh, there's, I can't quote the exact saying to you, but you know, you know the saying that says that something along the lines of everyone's parents are stupid until you become an adult? Something along those lines? The idea being that you think your parents don't know anything until you finally grow up? Um, I, I don't think that as a kid, I, I don't think it's natural in a kid to be thankful to their parents. I don't think that that's probably a natural occurrence. I'm sure that it happens sometimes, but like, uh, we, we were not rich growing up. We didn't have a lot of money. We had definitely more money than my dad did. My dad was dirt poor, but, uh, you know, we'd get one pair of tennis shoes. Um, you'd buy, you'd go to you'd, Mervyn's or Sears or something, you know, and you'd, you'd get your one pair of white Reeboks in August, and that was your shoes for the whole year, and you'd wear them out, and then you'd get another one next, next August, you know? And we had one church outfit. You got a new church outfit every Easter, so, and that was your church outfit for a year, you know? And, uh, and so, and Lee jeans. I'd go and get my two pair of Lee jeans for the school year. Uh, until I was 11 years old, I had to wear the girls' Lees. Um, I don't know that I had to. I was weirdly skinny and long and 
the boys' jeans didn't fit me well, I begged my mom when we'd go to the store if I, if I could try them on in the boys' section. She was like, we're not going to walk all the way across the store to try these on in the boys' section. It crippled me as a kid. Those are definitely some things I'm not thankful for. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so trying on the girls' lees, you know, with my white Reeboks and looking cool. I, I wanted the white Reebok high tops. Those were the things, you know. And, uh, and, and so um, here we were. We, I think about those things. And then I think about how from seventh grade probably through high school, uh, my, my parents paid for private art lessons for me. Every week. And, I, and we didn't have any money. Like, we just didn't, you know? And I don't, I don't think in seventh grade or eighth grade or ninth or probably all the way through high school, I don't know that I was thankful for that. I don't know that I ever thought about it. It's definitely had an impact on who I am today, right? It's changed who I am today. I, I love art and I paint because of these things that were instilled in me. But I don't know that we think about those things very well. And, and if you'll allow me this analogy, I, I think that most of us in our faith are children, who are not thankful to God for the things that he has worked in our lives. And my prayer is that I would grow up into a mature Christian who would be grateful and thankful to God for who he is and what he's done. That I would think rightly on him. That I would think rightly on eternity. That I would think rightly on righteousness. That I would think rightly on, on uh, um, uh, resurrection life. That verses like uh, Romans chapter 7 that says, who will set me free from this body of sin? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That what that would do is it would stir up in me that I have been set free from sin. That I, that I would think back to Romans 6 and say that though once we were slaves to sin, we are no more. That, that instead of sitting in my sin and my sadness and my sorrow and saying, I'm just destined to be like this, I'm only human, that I would rejoice in God who shed blood for me, has set me free from sin's power, that I might walk in holiness. That's something to be thankful for. Instead, what we do is we go, man, this is just who I am. I'm, I'm just destined to screw up. I'm just destined to walk in sin. I'm just destined. But we're not that. Thanks be to God. It's sometimes difficult for us to see past our own noses. We can't really imagine that. In fact, I shared this some weeks back that our view of eternity and our view of eternity with God is tarnished by the value we placed on the temporary. And God, don't come back until... God, let me do this first. Let me enjoy this part of my marriage first. Or let me be married. Or let me enjoy my kids. Or let me... We have, we have a view that eternity comes in second place to the pleasures of this world. Even the really good pleasures of this world. And because our view of eternity is misshapen and it's, and it's uh, misconstrued, it's very difficult for us to be thankful to God. There is a place in heaven in the presence of God for each of us who have named the name Jesus. We, we will stand before the King of Kings. We will stand before the Lord of Lords. And we will be called holy and righteous. We will be called the children of God. And there will be no more tears and no more pain and no more suffering. And sin and death will be abolished. And we should be able to give thanks to God for that. And yet we go, yeah, but look, my, my car is in the shop. Because our view of the temporary things has a higher position in our thinking than does the work of Jesus. It's hard to be thankful for the things of God that we aren't aware of. Listen to this. This is from uh, 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians 4, I want you to hear what Paul says. I'm going to read verse 15, and then I'm going to expand and we'll go out to a little bit further parts of this text but second corinthians 4 15 says for it is all for your sake his preaching of the gospel it is all for your sake so that as grace extends to more and more people it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of god now here's what paul's just said He's just said that all of his preaching and all of his suffering is for the sake of those who would hear the gospel so that more and more people can receive the grace of God and so that as more and more people receive the grace of God, it would result in more and more thanksgiving being given to God. That's what Paul is talking about here. I want to show you this. If you back up with me to verse 7, 
There's, there's a we in this text, and there is a you in this text. There's a lot of we in this text. The we is not all Christians. Paul is talking about himself and Barnabas in this text, and he is talking about them as preachers of the gospel. And he says this of himself and Barnabas. Uh, this was often taught to me as a kid that this is every Christian. I, I think there's application there, but that's not exactly what Paul means. So 2 Corinthians 4, 7, Paul says, But we have this treasure, that's the gospel, in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. In other words, the gospel is bigger than the one who carries the gospel. He goes, I am just a, I'm just a, a clay jar. I, I'm just the weak instrument. The gospel is big. The gospel is powerful. And we carry the treasure of the gospel in weak vessels so that your, uh, your appreciation and the value will not rest on the vessel, but will rest on the gospel that it's, that's carried by the vessel. Does that make sense? Basically, I want you to value uh, the news of Jesus more than you value me. He says something very similar in 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2. We don't have time to look at that right now. But Paul says, but we, these clay jars, these, these uh, Paul and Barnabas, these preachers of the gospel, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in, in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus can be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are constantly being given over to death uh, for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus can be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, all this persecution, all this trial, but life, the gospel that's being preached, is at work in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe. We believe the message of Jesus and we speak, knowing that God who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will raise us up with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all done for your sake, so that as grace extends more and more, more and more uh, to more and more people, it will increase the thanksgiving in the, to the glory of God. We don't lose heart. Though our outward nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things which are seen, but to the things which are unseen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the unseen things are eternal. Here's what Paul said. He said, I come to you and I bring to you the gospel for your sake that you may know Jesus and that it may increase the thanksgiving that is laid at the feet of God for his glory forever and ever. And he goes, and I do it while bearing persecution and while bearing trials and while being forsaken and while being hated. And I do this and I am able to do this because my eyes are set not on the temporary things of the persecution and the trials and the being forsaken, but on the eternal things things that God who raised Jesus from the dead will raise us up from the dead and will raise you up from the dead and will join us together in Christ Jesus. And that's why Paul went and lived the way that he lived because his eyes were set rightly on the things of God. And he, he's able to say, look, I consider it all joy. He's able to give thanksgiving to God in his suffering because his suffering is abounding, it is, is causing the, the gospel to be, to be spread and the news of Christ to be known. And I just wonder how many of us are living our lives with an attitude of thanksgiving, with this idea that we would live in such a way that not only we would be thankful, but that we would live in such a way such that the thankfulness to God would be magnified in us and those around us. How many times... How many times, uh, well, I appreciate what Micah said a minute ago uh, when he was leading the songs and he said that, you know, he prays, he prays even for like what he said were stupid things or trivial things. And, and he said, I, I think that God hears us in that. And Micah was being modest, I think. Um, he knows that God hears us in that. He's certain of it. And, and God, he, we, we cry out to God and we know that God hears us. It's... It, I don't know. One of the things, I have, I have three sisters. One of my sisters uh, is Haley, and you may know her um, from Paul Ann, um, uh, and she's a few years younger than me. And one of the things that Haley does better probably than anybody I've ever known is that Haley prays about everything, like everything. She just does. 
And I know that about her. And so like when I've lost my keys, I'll call my sister Haley and go, look, I need you to pray that I'll find my keys, you know? And Haley is quick to pray for lost keys or for a misplaced ring or whatever it is. I, she'll just pray about it. She just does. She's very, very good at that. And what we tend to do, and one of the things that I think that, that has made Haley really good at is thankfulness to God. Because what we tend to do is go, man, I can't find my keys. And then we look for them and we find our keys and we're like, oh, good, I found my keys. But when our hearts are directed towards God and we've brought that petition before the Lord and we say, God, I can't find my keys. And then we find our keys. Where is our thanksgiving directed? To God. You know, thank you, God. <laughs> um, when when uh, you forget that you're supposed to do something and at the right time you remember, oh, I need to do this thing and everything works out and it's timely. We just go, oh, that was fortunate that I remembered that instead of going, man, thank you, God. What, what did Paul say a moment ago? He said, always give thanks and in everything, always giving thanks and for everything giving thanks. And that is an impossible thing for us to do unless our mind is set on God. Paul says, look, I, I'm, I'm able to give thanks for the suffering that I'm enduring because my suffering is temporary, but the glory that I have will be eternal. And he says, and all of this suffering, all this trials that I'm going through is for your sake so that as grace extends to more and more people, it can increase thanksgiving to God. I just, I want us to think about that. Is your life, because even though Paul is talking specifically about him and those who are carrying the gospel, I want you to think about this for just a moment. Is your life being lived in such a way that when people see it, it will direct their thankfulness to God in heaven? And if not, it is probably because we ourselves are not very thankful to God. If our lives are not pointing others with, with thankfulness to God, it's probably because we ourselves are not very thankful to him. You ever, you ever just, I don't know how to explain this. Maybe you'll understand what I mean. Michelle and I have been married for almost 16 years. We've been together for 16 and a half years. And there are, we like each other all the time. All the time. We just really like each other. Every now and then, we like each other a lot. Like, it's just different. Nothing has changed, but there are just times that she'll just look at me and she's like, I just love you extra today, you know? You ever, you ever just feel that? Like, you're just like, man, I just, I didn't hate you yesterday, but, you know, today, like, I just like you extra. And I'm like, yeah, okay, cool, you know, and I'm not in that same moment. But then, like, a few months later, I'll be like, man, I don't know what it is, but today I just like you extra, you know? You ever feel that? I just, this, I just like you extra, it, and, and so it's not, it's, not that, it's not that I'm not thankful for my wife and grateful for my wife on a daily basis, but there are moments that I am laser focused and I'm just keyed into, man, I'm just really appreciative of this person in my life. I'm just really grateful for them. I, th I think that most of the time in our marriages, I think most of the time in our close relationships, and I think most of the time, especially in our relationship with God, we just kind of go day in and day out. And every now and then we have these moments where we are aware of our gratefulness and thankfulness to God. But what if it was like that all the time? What would your life, how would your life, your relationship with Christ look different if instead of those moments where you said, God, I am just really grateful. Like, have you ever been really grateful to God for his forgiveness when you're deeply aware of your sin? You have a moment where you're just confronted with your own depravity and you're like, man, God, I am so grateful that you are a forgiving God. What if that moment wasn't a fleeting thing? What if that was something that just lived in the front of our hearts, in the, in the, in, in the front of our eyes, and we just constantly recognize that God's grace is big and that it's good? What if we just lived in such a way where our thankfulness to God was, was directed towards him? That where, when we faced the suffering of this world, we said, thank you, God, that this suffering is but temporary, but your glory is eternal. Thank you, God, that this isn't the end of the story. Thank you, God, that in all of my heartache, in all of my pain, and in all of my misery, your glory is imminent. And your return is guaranteed. And we said, thank you, God. I can't tell you that tomorrow will be a good day. In fact, it might be really crappy. But I can tell you that God will be unchanged. And that's something for which we can give thanks. Speaking of the resurrection and the return of Christ, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Well, 
15, 56 says this, the sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have victory over sin. We have victory over death. We have freedom from the law. Thanks be to God who gives us victory over these things through Jesus. And then the last verse of 1 Corinthians 15. And 1 Corinthians 15 is all about the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of the believer. And he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Be steadfast and immovable. Like, uh, we... There are 167 hours until I'll see many of you again. 168 hours in a week, you'll show up in 167 for the early service next week. There are 167 hours. And I'm asking this question for you and for me. How many of them will be spent giving thanks to God? How many hours will pass between now and then where we'll just do life and we'll go to work and we'll pay the bills and we'll cook dinner and we'll do the dishes and we'll do the laundry and we'll mow the grass and we'll pull the weeds and we'll pick up the kids and then we'll take the other kid to football practice and then we'll pick up this kid from football practice and then we'll go do this and we'll put 200 miles on our car in a day in Tom Green County and we'll be driving back and forth all over the place and we'll do all this stuff and then we'll get to bed at night and we'll be like, what do we have on the schedule tomorrow? And we'll talk with our spouse or we'll look through our calendar and we'll see what needs to be done tomorrow and we'll make sure that it gets done. And then some of the things will happen because it took you longer at the store than you thought. And so you'll move those to the next day and then you'll move those to the next day and eventually they'll get done. But how many moments will pass before we're stirred up to give thanks to God again? Not because the financial blessing came in, not because... You got the test results back and everything is okay, not because uh, some loss was averted or some pain was healed, but simply because God is God. Because he sent his son to shed his blood to rescue us from sin and death and bring us into fellowship with him in righteousness and glory. To be able to say, these pains are temporary. Your glory is eternal. And to be able to say that I'm living this life with the aim that not only would I be thankful to God, but that it would abound in the lives of others with thankfulness directed to Jesus Christ. Thankfulness is a mark of the person of faith. And I'm just going to tell you, I stink at it and that's not okay anymore. It brings us to our prayer today. And I'm praying it with you, trust me. And our prayer today is this, God, give us thankful hearts. Would you take just a moment right where you are to pray that? God, give us thankful hearts. God, I don't know the shape of the week that lies ahead of us. I don't know uh, what struggles we'll face, what blessings we'll receive. I don't know, God, what sorrows are just around the corner. But I do know, God, that you are good. And I do know, God, that you are just and faithful and righteous and holy and full of glory. And I do know, God, that you love us that you've forgiven us, and that you've not only forgiven us, but that you have set us free from sin's power and from the power of death, and that all who believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. 
and that the suffering of this earth is temporary, but your glory is eternal. And so God, I come before you this morning, pathetic at it, but I come before you this morning, God, giving you thanks. And I ask God that you would stir up in me and in us a heart of thanksgiving. Not just in the moment where things go our way, but in every moment, always giving thanks to you, Lord God, through Jesus Christ.